Okay, last week we celebrated that Jesus is alive. This week we will learn about the special job that Jesus asked us to do before he went home to heaven. But before I tell our story, I want to do our absolutely true song. So go ahead, get your clapping hands ready. Let's do it together. Okay, let's go. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Everything the Bible says is absolutely true. And that's the case with our story today. On that very first Easter morning, Jesus rose from the dead and he began to visit his disciples and others. On that same day, two friends were walking sadly, talking about Jesus' death. And while they were walking, Jesus came up and started walking with them. They did not know it was Jesus. They were very sad because they thought that Jesus had died. They still didn't understand that Jesus had rose from the dead. They did not understand that Jesus gave his life so we can live with him in heaven. When they got to where they were going, their eyes were opened to see that it was indeed Jesus. The two men were so excited that they almost ran the whole way back to Jerusalem. That was six miles, and it was at night to tell the disciples that they had seen Jesus. Jesus' disciples were still in Jerusalem, hiding in a room where the door was locked tight. They were afraid that the priests and guards were, would arrest them for knowing Jesus. When the men arrived, the disciples let one in, then closed and locked the door. When one of the men was telling them what happened, suddenly Jesus appeared in the middle of the room and said, Peace to you. They were so afraid. They thought Jesus was a ghost because they knew that they had shut and locked the door. Jesus showed himself to his disciples. He showed them where the nails had been in his hands and in his feet. And yes, it was Jesus. Then to prove it was him, Jesus asked for a piece of fish to eat. Many times after he rose from the dead, Jesus showed himself to the disciples. He said to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He even appeared to 500 of his friends who had gathered to talk about him. Finally, it had been 40 days since Jesus had risen from the dead, and it was time for him to return to be with God the Father in heaven. When they reached the Mount of Olives near Jerusalem, Jesus told his friends to wait there for the Holy Spirit to come. He said, tell all the people in the world about me. Jesus wanted his disciples to share his wonderful news with others, and he wants us to share the good news too that he died to save us from our sins and that Jesus gave his life so that we can be with him in heaven. After that, Jesus went up to heaven and the people knew they needed to tell everyone about Jesus. The disciples now understood that they were to go and tell everyone. Even though they could not see him, he would be with them and one day Jesus would come back on the clouds. Now, don't forget to practice your verse, Romans 5, 8, after our story today. And next week, we're going to be learning a new verse. I'll see you then.
I know it's been a while, but do you remember our word for last month? Perseverance. Let's practice the definition. Going the distance and staying the course even when it's tough. Let's say our memory verse, all right? Let's go. Pers about perseverance. Therefore, and by the way, kids, always you got to ask, when you see therefore, why is it therefore? But therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders sin so, and so easily tangles, and let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Hebrews 12, 1. All right. Now, our lesson comes at a time where perseverance is really going to be needed. Why is it important? Well, life's going to be tough. Sorry to tell you, but we're in a tough time right now, and there may even be tougher days ahead. So we're going to have to have perseverance, and we always need to focus on God first when things get tough. Likely you're, you're at home right now, trying to do homework, trying to connect to the internet, you're having problems with, with different things. Obviously, there's lots of things that are going on that are tough right now. But there are times when it, it may even get worse than that. And there are people that I've had to deal with, and we're going to talk about one today. And, you know, we're going to talk about a person that went through, had to persevere through a time when no one else was doing what he was supposed to be doing, which was something that God told him to do. And we're going to talk about Noah. And Noah stayed the course, and he followed God's plan because God's plan was perfect, even though others around him weren't doing it. All right, so where do you find the story of Noah? Does anybody know? I think I heard it, yes. It was, it's in Genesis, and it's in the creation era. So Noah was pretty old, and he was like 500 years old. And at that time, there were people on earth that had forgotten about God and had really kind of turned away from God and were sinning and doing all types of bad things. But Noah still followed God, and he sought after God. And God decided that the, the earth had become so corrupt, and this is in Genesis 6, 11 through 13, that God saw the, the earth was so corrupt that he decided to destroy all living things. But since Noah had been walking faithfully with God and obeying God, Noah would, would be rescued. God told Noah his plan, and Noah followed it. But man, was it a tough one. He had to build a boat, and he had to do all the hard work with his family, while at the time when there wasn't even rain on the earth. So why did he need a boat? Well, you know, there wasn't a Home Depot that he could go to. There wasn't a saw that he had. He probably got plenty of splinters in his fingers, but he had to do all this work, and he had to persevere. But ultimately, Noah had to stay the course, and he did that because God's plan was perfect. So do you know that Noah might have been distracted why he was trying to do this, this, uh, build this boat? Do you think there were some people making fun of him as he was building a boat in the middle of a big field somewhere and there was no flood or rain or anything like that? Well, we don't know all of his thoughts and temptations, but the Bible does tell us that in Genesis 6, that Noah did everything exactly as God commanded him. Not, Noah was able to stay the course because he followed God's plan, because God's plan was perfect even though all this other stuff was going on, that you know, people probably just thought he was crazy to build this big boat in the middle of nowhere. So I'd like to know if anybody like, uh, uh, knows the story of Noah, and I'd like to ask a question if you think you might know some of the, the facts in Noah's story. So first, number one question, why did God send a flood? Hmm. In Genesis 6, 5 through 6, the answer is God's 
peop God said the people's hearts were evil. So that's why he sent the flood. Now, could you imagine being the only person on earth at the time that was following God's plan? Everybody else was bad. Well, that's Noah. But Noah stayed the course and he followed God's plan because God's plan was perfect. All right, question number two. So how did Noah build the ark? Did he go to Home Depot? Did he uh, have a plan that he made up himself? All right, well, here's the answer. Genesis 6, 14 through 16 says, God gave specific instructions. So these instructions are what Noah used. He followed them perfectly. He stayed the course because he knew God's plan was perfect. Even though it was difficult, he did all those things that God told him to do, and it worked out. All right, next question. All right, so how long did Noah wait before it, before it started to rain. So when he got on the boat, how long did he have to wait before it started to rain? All right, well, the answer is in Genesis 6.10, or 7.10, that he waited a whole week. So let's think about that. Day number one, you're on the boat. It's sealed up, no rain. All right, well, maybe tomorrow. Day number two, day number three, day number four. Do you think he started to doubt a little bit? Well, Noah stayed the course, and he stayed the course because he knew God's plan was perfect, and he followed him. All right, next question. So once the flood came, how long did Noah stay on the boat and the family? Answer, for about a year. It rained 40 days and 40 nights, but they had to stay on the boat for over a year. So let's think about that. Uh, hopefully you guys have enough TP at home right now, but how do you think he felt after about three months without TP? Four months, five months, six months, 12 months. Wait a second, he had to take care of animals. Has anybody got a dog out there? Now my dog starts to stink after about a week, so we have to bathe him all the time because he's a poodle, and poodles smell, they've got hair. So imagine a boatload of animals and all the stuff that goes along with that after a year. Do you think they might have gotten a little bit tired of that. Noah stayed the course, and he stayed the course because God's plan was perfect. All right, final question. So what was the first thing that Noah did when he got off the ark? Answer, in, in Genesis 8, 18 and, uh, through 20, he said he built an altar to the Lord. Through it all, Noah loved and trusted the Lord. Through all the problems, challenges, everything that went on, he trusted the Lord because he knew that God's plan was perfect, so he persevered. All right. Now, it's important to understand why the flood happened and to understand that there was sin in the world. And because of that sin, God sent the flood. People were evil and, and disobeyed God. So in, in, in that time frame, God did not allow that and only allowed Noah to live. So he made a covenant with Noah after this happened and so that this would never happen again. And the covenant, oh, everybody knows, was a rainbow, exactly. So every time you see a rainbow, you know that that's God's covenant, that he's never going to send the flood again. So ultimately, God has a plan, and the plan for us is to follow God, but we have a choice, and that's called free will. So the choice is this. One, we can, uh, for, we can either keep sinning and stay away from God and follow our own plan, or we can uh, follow the plan that God made for us and listen to him. So ultimately that we want to follow God's plan because God's plan is perfect for us. God gives us a choice. We, you know, we as sinners have the opportunity to either follow his plan or not to follow it. So if we decide not to follow his plan, we follow our own plan, and that ultimately leads to death. Our option, though, is that number two is to follow God's plan 
And God sent us Jesus to help us with this big problem out there. It's called sin. And Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that he rescued us. He is our rescue plan. And ultimately, if we follow Jesus and we follow his plan, we will go to heaven. See, the thing is that these sinners we're talking about, they weren't just bad guys doing super evil things. It's me and it's you. We're both sinners. And everyone that has ever lived, we are all sinners. And we have the opportunity to choose to receive God's forgiveness through his gift to Jesus or reject it and do our own thing. When we trust that God's plan is perfect, we can persevere. Just like Noah, when life is hard, because it is, and it will be, when we're tempted to sin and we go on our way instead of God's way, we can remember that Noah and how he trusted God's plan and how God is faithful to save Noah. We can stay the course because God's plan is perfect. Good morning. I'm so excited to share with you this morning again. And hey, real quick, before we start this morning, this is what I want you to do. I want you to comment on this video. I want you to just write down the, the people that you're watching with. So in your house, y'all type in there, who are, who are you watching with? Um, I want us all to be able to see who we're worshiping with this morning. I think it would be cool to see that. I know it's going to be a lot of names, a lot of comments, but I would love for everyone to just be able to see who else is watching, and, and who is worshiping with them this morning, and we can share in that. So y'all do that for us um, right now as we're, as we're here and we get started. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue talking about what we talked about last week, but we're going to talk about the most important question you're going to ask yourself. And that question is, who is Jesus? Last week, we began talking about this and how in John 14, 1 through 5, Jesus tells his disciples that he will be leaving and that they know the way to where he's going. And then Thomas speaks up and he says, we have no idea where you are going. How, how are we, so how can we know the way? You know, it doesn't make sense to the disciples and they're, they're freaking out and they're worried about what's going on. But how many of us can relate to that? Right, we just, we don't know the way. We feel like we don't know the way. I, I know I, I can relate. Sometimes it just feels like the way that we need to go is blocked. Right? Or, or it's as if we have just lost our way and, and nothing we do is making it better. And then in John 14, 6, as we read last week, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Last week, we focused on, on the first answer to, to our question about who is Jesus, these three parts, and who is Jesus? And we talked about Jesus is the way. We talked about how he, he provides the way when, when we truly lean into him, he leads us in the way he wants us to go. And if you don't remember what, what, or you didn't see last week, you can go to our, our students' YouTube page, just Gateway Student Ministry. You can watch it there. But here's the thing. We talked about this. We can, we can be confident that, that the direction we go is right if we are following Jesus. So, something, sometimes our feeling of being lost can be due to the temptation to sin, right? Well, the, the way out of that temptation, the way out of that is also provided. We see in, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Even in our temptation to sin, we are not alone. You are not the, you're not the only one struggling with whatever temptation you're struggling with. And this way of escape from that temptation is always provided. You have to look for it, though. And then when you look for it, you find it, then you have to choose it. You have to choose to follow that way out of the temptation instead of choosing to give in to sin. So our, our answer one to who is Jesus is that Jesus is the way. The second answer to our question is, is what I want to talk about this morning. And the answer is just the next part of John 14, verse 6, where Jesus says that he is the truth. Because Jesus is the truth, and truth is something that we're all searching for so often. 
right? Our, our world is always searching for this, and we know this because you always hear people say, hey, live your truth, speak your truth, this is my truth, and on and we hear people talking about that. We live in a world that says that truth is, is relative and it can be different for different people in different situations, People also say that uh, morals can change depending on your situation, your age, your family situation, your financial status, and, and more things. I, I read something the other, the other day um, that said that students, for you, your generation, 24% of your generation believes that what is morally right and wrong changes over time based on society. You know, that's twice as much as the 12% of the boomer generation who believes that. There's also, there's a big sign um, in, the, in the capital of Norway that says, it says that truth is flexible. This is a thought that many people have today, right? People think truth is flexible, that, that truth can change based on situation, mood, or opinion. We're told by our society to think that whatever is right for me is right for me, and if you think I'm wrong, don't tell me, because we all live by our own set of rules. And there's a huge problem with thinking this way. If this is true, then even the rules and the laws that we have wouldn't be valid. If this were true, then there would be no way to know what is actually right and wrong, to know what is true and false. All right, It's just like how we measure things. For instance, right now, I want you to comment in the comment sections, um, how wide do you think this table is? This table that I have right here, how wide do you think it is? I want you to comment that. Some of you um, are, are thinking, okay, I got this. I'm going to be right. Some of you are just going to throw out a guess because you're like, man, there's no way that I will be exactly right. But I want, you to, I want you to try. I want you to put something in there. But some of you are sitting there, and you've closed your eyes, and you're thinking, okay, I've sat at one of those tables before. It's about this wide, and I think that's this. And, and you're thinking, okay, I got it. So comment in inches, how wide is this table? And, and some of you are confident in it, but the only way that we can know for sure, is to have some standard that we use to measure it. You, you see, if we just took everyone's guess, then, then we would have tables that are really all the same size, but online in different places, they're listed as different. Y'all, how hard would it be to furnish a house that way? If everybody just got to pick what size the table was, they just got to choose how, how wide it was. Y'all, the, the, that is why we have a set way to measure things, because the only way to know is to use a tape measure to use something, and this tape measure is the same no matter if we use it here or in any other state. This table will be the same size because we have measured it with the set standard, so it'll be the right size. And by the way, if I know y'all are wondering, um, is 23 and 3 quarters inches wide? So if you got it right, props to you. But, um, but seriously, like... It, that's, that's our standard. We need that standard. And in John 14, 6, Jesus wants us to know that he is the standard of truth. He, he was not just saying that he's one truth in a buffet line of religious options. Jesus is the truth. He, he defines what is true from what is false. And, and when you trust that Jesus is the truth, you begin to see that there is freedom living within God's authority. It says in um, John 8, 32, it says this, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. When you so, so when you trust in Jesus, you know that he is the way, that he is the truth, and, and you can be set free, free from worry, free from doubt, from shame, from feeling less than, from feeling unworthy, and, and many other things. When you trust in that, when you trust in Jesus, you can be free from those. You can have confidence in your Savior. And, and this morning, if you're wanting to be set free by this truth and you want to trust that he is the way and the truth, you need to begin by accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you've done this before but, but you want to keep growing, you do that too. We all can continually and need to continually grow in our relationship with the Lord. But students, if you want to make that decision today to follow Jesus, I just want you to text STUDENTS to 469-577-1112. If you do this, it's going to give you a link, and it'll take you somewhere to uh, fill something out for us. You can also text STUDENTS to, to that same number, 
If, if you're wanting to rededicate your life, if you've been thinking through that, if, if you want to be baptized, if that's something you've been thinking through, if you have questions, you're just wondering, okay, what does this life of following Jesus look like? Text that number, let us know. You can text the same number as well. You can text students to that. If you have prayer requests, y'all, we would love to be praying for you and praying with you. And so please let us know what those are. Share those with us. Students, listen, Jesus is the truth. And that truth will set you free. So trust that he is the truth and run to him to let that truth lead your life. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for this time that we have together. Lord, I pray that we would remember that you are the way, that you are the truth, but that we can follow you in that, Lord, that we would trust you. Lord, that we would choose you over everything else. It's in your name I pray, amen. Hey, y'all, next week we'll go through that, this third, third part, this third answer to our question of John 14, 6 of what it says. But I love you guys. Y'all stay, stay tuned. Steven's about to come up for a message for Connect Groups. And then we will see you back here at 1045 for worship. Love you guys. Have a great day. Good morning, church. I'm so excited that you're able to join us again from your homes. This is our Connect Group message for the week, and I'm so excited that we're going to be starting a new series here in a little bit at 1045. So I hope you stay tuned and join us with that and start texting your friends right now to join our live stream as well. And so we're going to be diving into Hebrews for the next several, several weeks, and I'm so excited that we get to, to, to work through this book together. And so our, our connect groups this week are going to be working through uh, just the first few verses in chapter one uh, of Hebrews. And really what we're going to be looking at is just the supremacy of of Jesus Christ and how God is better than any other thing available. And so it got me thinking a lot about uh, just technological advances um, just in my lifetime of, of, you know, I remember when I, one Christmas when I opened up my, my Nintendo for the first time and I got to play Tech Mobile and thinking now that I have an Xbox One and, and just how the graphics have changed how cars have changed from when I was born in 1982 to how they are now, that, that they now self-park. And just even thinking of the watch that I have, that I can answer phone calls, I can send pictures, text messages, emails from my watch. And just thinking that all these things change, but also in about a year, there's gonna be a different watch that's better than the one I have now. There's gonna be a different car that's better than the cars that we're driving right now. These things continue to improve and get better. But the thing about God is, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's no uh, bigger, better, more improved version of him. He's already totally amazing. And we know that through, through the saving grace that he's extended to us through what Jesus Christ had done on the cross. And that we serve a, a living God that, that rose from the grave three days later. It doesn't get any better than that. And so that's what we're really going to focus on this week is that, that Jesus Christ doesn't have a, a shelf life. He doesn't expire. There's no better thing that's going to come after this version of himself. He is already absolutely perfect, and he knows you by name. I think that's something incredible about our God, that he has stood the test of time, no matter what culture, no matter what society, that he continues to make himself known and continues to love on his people and walk this life with his people and saving us as he does it. It's an amazing thing about who Jesus is. And it got me thinking about this time and, and what we're having to do to meet as connect groups right now. And just the, techno the technology that we have to meet through Zoom meetings, to have FaceTime, to be able to stay connected with the people that we love most right now. And that's great. But the thing that I love about it is that we're doing these things because our love for the greatest thing that's ever existed, and that being God and Jesus Christ. I love that we have a personal relationship with him. I love that we can go to him in prayer, no matter if we're joyful or no matter if we're sad or if we're struggling, that he is with us always. It's something to, to, to really think about on a daily basis. It's just how intimate and personal our God is. And so we get to dive into that this week in our connect groups. 
And so again, if you don't have a connect group, this is a great time to join one. They're still meeting virtually and you can go to gatewayonline.org slash next steps and you can click on the, the connect group symbol and you can choose from a list of connect groups that we have meeting right now. My recommendation for you is if you're not involved in a connect group to choose one that fits your schedule when things start to go back to normal. So you already have a personal relationship with those folks. We also have another amazing ministry and you heard us talk a little bit about it this past Wednesday and that's our regeneration ministry. Chris Stovall is doing an amazing job to continue uh, to keep those groups going virtually and his team is doing an amazing job as well. And so they have groups that are working through those steps that are about to finish up those steps. They have groups that are just starting right now. And so if you are struggling right now and we all have brokenness and we all have a need for Jesus Christ, regeneration is a great opportunity to grow in a discipleship group, but be able to work through some of the challenges and the things that you're, you're struggling with right now. You can also go to gatewayonline.org slash next steps uh, and click on regeneration and you can find out um, how to register um, for regeneration right now. You can also go to the website and click on uh, the region tab and get more information about how our groups work. But I really highly encourage you uh, to join regeneration. It's a great opportunity for you to work through scripturally what you're dealing with, especially right now in this season. Here in a little bit, you're gonna to get to see a video of testimonies of people that have been through regeneration and just how impactful that it's been on their life. And the thing that I love about regeneration is it puts God exactly where he belongs, knowing that he is working through each and every one of these things with us. And if that doesn't show the supremacy of who God is, I don't know what does. That he knows us personally, and we get to work through scripture, and we get to, to, to be in prayer with the God that loves us more than anything. So church, we have amazing ways to stay connected um, in biblical community, whether that's connect groups or whether that's regeneration. I wanna urge you, if you're not involved in those ministries, to get involved today. Again, gatewayonline.org slash next steps. I'm so excited that you're able to join us today and I look forward to worshiping alongside of you here in a few moments. Thank you, church. Hi, I'm Brandy. Hi, my name is Andrew. My name is Lindsay. Hi, I'm Rob. I have a new life in Christ. I have a new life in Christ. And I'm recovering from alcoholism. My own marital infidelity. Anxiety. Anger. Overspending. Shame from my divorce. Addiction to pornography. Codependency. And I'm recovering from homosexuality. Past sexual abuse. And fear of abandonment. Hi, my name is Scott. And my name is Teresa. I have a new life in Christ and I'm recovering from depression. Bitterness from unforgiveness. Guilt and shame from past abortion. Disordered eating. Drug addiction. Lust. Pride. Finding my significance and what I think people think of me. Overeating. Insecurity. Selfishness. Not trusting God. And shame. 
Before I came to recovery, my life was hopeless. Full of secrets. Controlled by bitterness and anger. It was a lie. My life was defined by my sin. My marriage was falling apart. I was tired, exhausted from losing the battle against my struggle with sin. My life was a disaster. Unmanageable. Full of chaos. Isolated. Self-centered. And had lost my way. I just didn't like the way that God had made me. Really just struggled with what people thought about me. My life is all about controlling others so that I couldn't be rejected. I sought pleasure in all the things that the world had to offer, uh, and uh, all those things left me empty. Before I came to recovery, my life was unmanageable and out of control. It was a bottle of insecurity. Filled with frustration, anger, and bitterness towards my husband. Way too focused on me, what I want, and what I think. I wasn't ready to give up and surrender what I'd worked so hard to control. And I couldn't figure out why I wasn't finding any healing. My first night at recovery, I felt like I was unredeemable. I thought, how is this going to help me? No one could really understand how I felt. I'm terrified that I'd have to figure out how to live life sober. Completely defeated. I didn't want to see anybody, talk to anybody, have anybody acknowledge I was here. I wanted it to end really quickly. I felt weak, numb, dirty, like I had a spotlight on me. But I was amazed by everyone's courage. I felt a glimmer of hope because I knew I was among some other broken people. And I didn't have to hide my junk any longer. I was desperate for help. I didn't care what people thought anymore. I just wanted to be well. I shared things that I thought I would never tell anybody. I felt encouragement like there was hope. Relieved. I started to believe. I started to believe a new life was possible. When I heard story after story after story of how Christ showed up and changed everything. When I actually was able to forgive my husband. When I realized I was not alone in my struggles. Well, when I could see that my sin could be forgiven. Well, when I heard about God's grace. I started to believe that a new life was possible. When I acted in obedience to Christ and shared what had been done to me. When I saw God changing the lives of the other women in the group. When I realized how much I'd allowed my sin to define every single decision and behavior in my life. When I realized that God loved me no matter what I had done. People didn't run screaming from the room. They put their arm around me and they walked with me through that part of the journey. When I heard that it wasn't about what I had done but what Christ had done for me. When I realized that I didn't have to gain the approval of anyone. That God had already chosen me and he wasn't unaware of my struggles or my past. Because of Christ. Because of Christ. I now have joy. My life is now free from self-harm. Peaceful. Filled with hope. And meaningful. And I'm able to share that with people. Because of Christ, my life is now completely changed. Just because I know that God loves me regardless of what I do. My marriage is thriving. My life is no longer determined by circumstances. I'm free from the pain of the past. Free of the bondage of my addiction. I find my joy and my worth in Jesus Christ. There are times when I still struggle, but I have a group of men behind me that spur me on and encourage me. If I could tell you one thing. One thing. One thing. If I could tell you one thing tonight. It would be this. You are not alone. God loves you and he has plans for you. You. you haven't done anything that God cannot forgive. And that if he could save a wretch like me, he can save you too. Don't let fear hold you back from experiencing the freedom that Christ has for you. This is a safe place to work through the pain of your past. You're in the right place. And I'm so excited for you. Don't give up. Be here every time you can. It is worth your time. And be fully committed. His grace is sufficient. So bring him all of your struggles. There's recovery in Christ when life is broken because you matter to God. God loves you. Find our online bulletin on the YouVersion Bible app. Open the Bible app on your smartphone or tablet. Tap the More tab. Tap Events. Select Gateway Community Church Wiley from the list of events. In the bulletin, you can see sermon notes and scripture for today's message. Let us know if you made a decision. online. You can also find a link to the Dwell Scripture Listening app and even share the bulletin with your friends.
strength and power Yours alone now and forever Love this world could never stop There is no one like our God Reaching down to touch the so good to worship with you this morning. The glory is his. We're going to do a new song now for you. It's called Then He Rose. Yeah. 
church. Gateway staff, we would like to thank you for spending your Sunday morning with us this morning. If this is your first time to be with Gateway this morning, or if you're new to Gateway, you should see a number appear at the bottom of the screen. If you wouldn't mind texting the word guest, uh, you should be responded back to with a link that would allow us to, or allow you to jot down some of your information just to help us uh, get to know you a little bit better and uh, to get some more information to you about Gateway as well. Uh, for everyone, uh, guests and current uh, members, if you have any special prayer requests that you'd like uh, to be made known to the church, you should see, again, the same number that's listed below. If you wouldn't mind uh, texting the word prayer to that number, again, you should be replied back to with the link that will allow us to uh, type in your prayer request and uh, please send that to us. We would like to know how we can be praying for you. So we're going to take an opportunity right now to pray together and then we will continue forward with our service. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here this morning. Father, we thank you so much for your love, the love that we have because of Jesus. Uh, Father, we pray that you be with Pastor Blake and the staff as uh, they deliver the service to us this morning. And Father, we just thank you so much for your love. It is your love that binds us all together, even in times like this. Father, we pray that you be with us this week and that uh, you'd help us to have a good Sunday morning with you. In Jesus' name, amen.
chapter 1. I'm going to begin at verse 10. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. The passage is about Christ. It's about the Lord that we worship today, Jesus, who died for our sins, who rose from the grave and brought us resurrection from the dead, freedom from sin. In the Bible, when it talks about someone's name, that name encapsulates the character of the person. So when we talk about the name of Jesus, we are talking about all of who Jesus is. When we talk about worshiping his name, glorifying his name, lifting up his name, praising his name, we are praising all that he is. And this passage tells us that he, Jesus, was the the creator. He was involved in the process of creation of, of all the universe, of us, of everything that is and that he will outlast everything that is. It says that he is eternal and he never, ever changes.
That's the name we worship today. The name of Jesus. of creation you Lord Jesus were the one through whom and by whom and for whom all things were created and we exist today to bring glory to your name the name that encapsulates all that you are Savior, King, Prophet, Priest thank you Lord for what you have done for us and for giving us the opportunity to worship you. We ask you now, speak to us by Pastor Blake through your word. Deliver the word that you have for us through his mouth today. Bless him with your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm excited to jump into the book of Hebrews with you this morning as we get to start a new series. But before we do, I just had to share something with you. How appropriate the Word of God is for whatever circumstance we might be in. I just have to tell you, this morning I decided to read a little bit in the book of Ezekiel. And uh, was in Ezekiel, uh, first few chapters of Ezekiel. But Ezekiel chapter 3, I read this verse. And I thought it's too good not to share. It says in Ezekiel 3 verse 24, Then the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet. He spoke to me and said, okay, what was this message from the Spirit? He spoke to me and said, go shut yourself inside your house. Now, how appropriate can you get more than that? It's just amazing to me. You never know what you're going to find in the Word of God and how it might just apply. Of course, a little different context there, but we can relate to that verse, I think, uh, in our, our day that we're in. But today is all about Hebrews. I want to jump into this, what I believe is one of the richest books in the New Testament. And the reason for that is because the book of Hebrews was written to Jewish believers, to Hebrews, to help tie the Old Testament 
and all that happened before the coming of Christ to help tie that to Christ and what we believe as followers of Jesus. And so there's a richness to our faith that quite honestly most of us probably don't have a full appreciation for. Uh, most of you who are listening or watching right now probably don't consider yourselves to be Old Testament scholars, and I don't either. Uh, most of us don't have that background of growing up with that being our primary thing that we understand. And so Hebrews was written by somebody who obviously did have that type of a background, uh, which, by the way, little aside here, we don't know exactly who wrote the book of Hebrews. For a long time, this was called Paul's letter to the Hebrews. And so the assumption was that Paul wrote this letter. But then, uh, after many years, uh, Martin Luther, for example, early 1500s, began to question that a little bit. And some reasons for that are because he doesn't identify himself as the author of the letter, which he does in his other letters. The style's a little bit different, grammar's a little bit different. Uh, and so... Some suggestions were made of potentially some other authors. Maybe Barnabas was who Luther suggested. Apollos has been somebody else that's been suggested. Either way, all that to say, we don't know exactly who wrote it. It really doesn't matter. What we do know is that the book of Hebrews is universally accepted as an authentic book of the New Testament. It, it is part of our, our New Testament scripture. Um, but this book was written by somebody with a significant background in the Jewish faith, and they were helping tie together uh, those pieces of the, of the Old Testament, the theology of the Old Testament to who Jesus is. So if you've ever read, if you ever struggled a little bit with the Old Testament, you ever read something and thought, I, this doesn't seem to fit. In fact, it maybe almost seems opposite from what I see in the person of Jesus or what I see revealed in the New Testament. And if ever we think that way, that's an indication that we really don't understand fully what we're reading in the Old Testament because we know that God doesn't contradict himself. And we know that Jesus said he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And so Hebrews is about helping us understand how Jesus, our Messiah, is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. And so hopefully it'll shed some light uh, on some of our understanding of the Old Testament as we dig into it. Now some of you that are really into that kind of stuff, really into the, the theology and into the details are starting to nerd out right now. You're getting really excited about this. And others of you maybe you are starting to check out and you're thinking, I might go to the kitchen right now, go grab me a little snack. Don't do that, okay? Don't tune out either physically or mentally. Hang with me because the other thing I love about this book is that not only is it a rich theological book, but there's so much practical application there. And this is the way it's supposed to work. You know, the theology is the foundation upon which we can build, but we need, it's not enough. Uh, you don't just put a foundation down and not build on top of it. We build on that solid theology to build a structure that helps us to learn how do we live out our faith day to day. And so we'll get there as we continue on. In the book of Hebrews. But let's just jump in right now with the first four verses. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Now let's stop there for a moment, and we'll come back and read the rest of the chapter here in just a little bit. Uh, but I love this. I love Hebrews chapter 1. Because this whole chapter is about Jesus. It's about this, this wonderful name that we were able to sing about a moment ago. And just how incredible Jesus is. How Jesus is exalted higher than anyone or anything else. That's really what Hebrews chapter 1 is all about. And I love this because it gives us an opportunity to brag on Jesus. It gives us an opportunity to appreciate who he is. And you know, we enjoy bragging on those we love, don't we? When we are proud of someone... Maybe in the right context. We don't want to be too obnoxious about it. But we enjoy bragging on those that we love. Parents, don't you love bragging on your kids? Don't you love telling somebody something special that happened or something special that they did or who they are and what you love about them? Grandparents, we know you love bragging on your grandkids. And, and kids, at least when they're younger, 
They love to brag on their parents. They like to talk about how amazing their parents are. And then they hit the teenage years. And Taylor, you got to straighten them out for us so that they start bragging on their parents just a little bit more. But no, that's, things shift a little bit, right? But they, they're, they're quick to brag on their friends or on a boyfriend or a girlfriend. We love to brag on those that, that we hold in highest regard, don't we? And so I love that about Hebrews 1 because it gives us a chance to lift up the name of Jesus. And there's so many uh, reasons to do that and there's so much good content here that I want us to jump into. We're going to... We're going to look today at really two main ideas, and I'm going to spend the majority of our time on the second one. But the first one is important to talk about again. So let me just read one more time the first couple of verses. It says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. So God spoke to their ancestors, talking about the the Hebrew people here, this is the Jewish people, God spoke through the prophets. But now it says God has spoken through His Son. The the way He did it, I I love the way it's described, the way He spoke to the prophets, it says it many times and in various ways. God used many different people, there were many different mouthpieces, many different prophets. He used a lot of different creative methods to communicate through His people. That's one of the things when you read through the books of the prophets, you find there's some weird stuff that they were doing sometimes that God was very creative in communicating. In fact, I mentioned uh, one of the reasons that I started reading in Ezekiel again today is because I knew that I was going to quote some from Ezekiel chapter 4 today. But in Ezekiel 4, God tells him to, uh, to build, he get, tells him to get some clay. I guess that was, you know, a version of Plato back then. But get some clay and to build the city of Jerusalem. And then he says, and then lay siege to it. And which is just, I don't know if it's just me, that, that kind of, you know, I picture look like a grown-up playing with G.I. Joe things or something. But he's laying siege to the city. But this was serious stuff at the time. And so he's, he's giving a symbol of what God is doing. But then he tells him to do this. He says, I want you to lie on your side for the number of days, each day to represent one of the years that my people were rebellious. So for the people of Israel, he has to lie on his side for 390 days straight. To represent the 390 years of rebellion. Then he gets to flip over to his other side. And he spends 40 days to represent the 40 years of Judah that they were rebellious. Now that's bad enough right there. But then you get a little bit further into chapter 4. And it tells about what he is to cook for himself. By the way, if anybody's ever had Ezekiel bread. Which I just discovered that not too long ago. It's pretty good stuff by the way. But Ezekiel bread is based on Ezekiel chapter 4. He tells him to bake bread. Here's the problem. You remember what he told him to use for fuel to bake his bread? Human excrement. So God is is teaching a lesson about impurity and the impurity of his people. And he has his prophet cook his meal over his own poop. that's, That's creative communication right there, I would say. I am very thankful, as I've said many times before... That, that I haven't been asked as a communicator of God's word to do something like that, and hopefully that won't happen. But, but God can, create, can, can creatively communicate and, and does so. But now it says that was in the past, that was through the prophets in, in, in various times and various ways through different people. Now his communication comes through one person, and it's through Christ. And you see, Christ now has the final word. He is the final authority. So when Christ speaks... That, that's the end of that. That is the fulfillment of whatever it is that he's speaking about. And there are certain things in the Old Testament that Jesus speaks about and, and then gives a, a new light on that and, and, and helps us understand ultimately the intent behind it and, and how it's fulfilled in him. Let me give you an example from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus does this several times in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you've heard that it was said or it was written, but I tell you. Matthew 5. Verse 38 and 39. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. See, Jesus is fulfilling this and saying, let me tell you where ultimately this was headed. And so he becomes the final word and the final authority on everything. And and so Jesus is the way that God speaks to us. We have to run everything through the filter of who Christ is and what Christ has revealed to us. That's the first thing, is that God speaks to us today through Christ. But the the question then should be asked, okay, why? 
What gives Jesus the authority? Why, why is Jesus the final authority for God to speak to us? And here's the second main idea is that Jesus is superior to everything and everyone else. That's why. Look at verse 4 again. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. See, Jesus is superior for, for several reasons. In fact, let's continue reading on. We've we, we got enough, really, in the first four verses to carry us for a little while. But there's some more good stuff there in verse 5 and following. It says, starting in verse 5, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I become your father? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. We'll come back to that verse in a minute. And speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed, but you remain the same and your years will never end. To which of, of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So you see from, from this whole chapter, this idea that Jesus is exalted and is higher and superior to anyone or anything else. Now let's talk about why. Several reasons why, several things that it says in this passage, but we're just going to fire the big gun first. Here's the big gun. It's that Jesus himself is one with God. That's why Jesus is superior, because we see in verse 3 and in the other verses that we read that he's one with God. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Let's talk about both of those ideas, the radiance of God's glory. That word radiance is a compound word in the Greek. It starts with, uh, with a, a beginning phrase that means to intensify whatever is going to follow after that. The word that follows that is the word to shine. And so the idea here is that Jesus shines the glory of God to an intensity that, that is far beyond anything else. Think about, for example, when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain with him, the, the transfiguration, we call it. And the Bible tells us that, that Jesus began to, that his face shone and that his, his clothes turned as white, uh, as light. And we see this glory of God radiating out of Jesus and, and who he was. Now, this is important. It was different from what we, we see in Moses, what was recorded with Moses in the Old Testament. Moses, when he would meet face to face with God, the glory of God would still shine on his face. It would be reflected on his face, and so Moses would wear a veil uh, to, to kind of cover over that. This is different because Moses was just reflecting the glory of God. Jesus is radiating the glory of God from within because he is one with God, because he is God and as a result he was able to do that the second thing that that it says there is that he is the exact representation of God that's a Greek word character which you can probably figure out we get our word character if you think about writing down something leaving an exact representation that is a character I brought with me a little something to have a little fun and a little visual today this is an embosser this was the uh, first gift that I got when I was finishing up my doctorate from my sweet wife. And so uh, it's something that I could use to, uh, to mark my books if I want to loan them out. But the way this works is there are several characters inside this little embosser here. And if you put it on a piece of paper, and I'll show you what it looks like in a minute, but you press it down. This is literally what that word means. It was talking about a tool that would press and leave a mark. Then you see on the, on the other side of it, how it leaves exactly what was in there before. It is an exact representation of that, that character that, that we use. And in the same way, Jesus is an exact representation of God and who God is. He is one with God. Not that he just shows some of who God is, but he is that exact representation 
of God. Now, in a lot of translations in verse 3, it talks about him being the exact representation. And then it uses the phrase of his essence or of his nature. And those words are important if you know something about church history because in church history, uh, early 4th century, there, there was a big controversy about the essence or nature of Christ. And this is important for us to understand a little bit of, of what they argued over and the decision that they came to. Let me introduce you to a man named Arius. He was a presbyter in Alexandria, Egypt at the turn of the 4th century. He was highly educated. He was highly influential. And he began to teach that Jesus was not of the same essence or not of the same nature as God. That there was something divine about Jesus, but he was lower than truly being on, on the level of, of who God is. And one of the things that he did is he created a little song, and this doesn't sound like a very exciting song to me, but maybe he had a catchy tune that went with it. But his little song said this, he said, there was a time when he, talking about Christ, was not. There was a time when he was not. Now, I won't try to guess what the tune was or sing it for you because that wouldn't be good. But his point was that, that he believed that Jesus was created like another created being. He wasn't God eternal uh, as we now know him to be. And so this became so widespread that one of the church fathers, Gregory of Nyssa, said that you couldn't even go to the market without getting into an argument with the merchants in the market about the essence and nature of Christ. And so it was a big deal. Constantine was the emperor at that time. He called for a council to come together. They met in a place called Nicaea. It's the Council of Nicaea, 325. And they met to, to decide, because this was becoming very divisive, they met to make a decision, what is the official position of the church on the nature of Christ? And standing against Arius and his teaching was a guy not by the name of Athanasius. He argued for the full divinity of Jesus based on his understanding of salvation. Now here was his argument in essence. Salvation is partaking in the nature of God. Therefore... The only one who could grant that type of salvation must be God himself. And so for us to find our salvation in Christ, it's necessary for Christ to be of the nature of God, be in essence the same as God. And he's right. The church uh, agreed with this and came to this conclusion. In fact, I want you to listen to how strongly they worded their decision. It says, but to those who say, once he was not or that he was not before his generation, or he came to be out of nothing, or who assert that he, the Son of God, is of a different hypostasis or usia, meaning nature, or that he is a creature, or changeable, or mutable, the Catholic and Apostolic Church anathematizes them. Now that's a strong statement there about the importance of understanding the nature of Christ and who he is. And by the way, if you wonder why does that matter, because if Jesus was just a created being, if he just became somewhat divine, what's to stop God from doing that again? What's to stop somebody else? And that's the rabbit trail, by the way, you go down with Mormonism and some other heretical teachings, is that, that you could eventually become divine, or you could eventually, God could choose that. And so it's important that we understand the nature of Christ. So what evidence is there then? That's a bold claim to say that Jesus is one with God. Let me give you a few things to consider uh, just as, as a way of, of providing some support to that belief. Now granted, a lot of what I want to share with you here comes from Scripture. Somebody might say, well, I don't believe the Bible to begin with. Okay, We don't have time to go into a, a lengthy discourse right now on why the Bible is reliable and why it is, and we could talk about that at another time. Uh, but granted, a lot of what we know about Christ comes through uh, the, the record of Scripture. But here are some things that, that we do know that point to the fact that Jesus is one with God. His own teaching pointed to this. Jesus taught about it himself. Take, for example, John 10, verse 30, where Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Now, if you wonder how that was understood, keep reading in verse 31, where it says, The Jews again carried stones in order that they might stone him. Why were they going to stone him? Read ahead verse 33 and, and we'll find out. They were stoning him, it says, because he had spoken blasphemy and made himself God. They understood what he was saying when he said, I and the Father are one. 
And here's the thing. Jesus never backed down from that claim, and he never said that they misunderstood him. Jesus lamented the fact that they did not believe him, but he never lamented being misunderstood. They understood clearly what he was saying. Jesus taught it himself. Here's another reason for us to point to the fact that Jesus was one with God, and that was his ability to perform miracles. Now again, granted, there are people in the Bible, there are others that could perform miracles, but Jesus did this out of his own authority. He was able to perform miracles like helping the, the lame walk, giving sight to the blind, even raising the dead. Even exercising authority over nature. You remember when Jesus was in the boat with his disciples and the storm threatened to, to capsize the boat and Jesus stood up and he said, peace, be still, and all of a sudden just everything went calm. You, only God could do that. And so his miracles pointed to who he was. Um, the, the fact that Jesus exercised functions that belonged wholly to God. Let me give you an example. Forgiving sins. You recall the paralytic that was brought to Jesus by some friends for Jesus to heal him. Before Jesus did anything to heal him physically, and he did heal him physically, the first thing he did was he said, your sins are forgiven. Now those that heard that reacted uh, by saying he's spoken blasphemy. He's, he's claiming to be God because only God has the authority to forgive sins. And they were exactly right. Not about the blasphemy part, but they were exactly right that by saying, I, I forgive your sins, that was a claim to be one with God. And we could talk about other things that point to, this, to, to the evidence of the fact that Jesus is one with God. But I'll just end with one. We're only a week past our celebration of, of Resurrection Day. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the ultimate uh, proof that Jesus was one with God. The fact that he came back to life from the dead. John chapter 10, starting in verse 17, it says, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Now listen to this next sentence. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So Jesus had this authority because of who he was and, and his oneness with God, not only to lay down his life, to give up his life for us, but to, 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 to take it back up to be raised from the dead. The resurrection really is our ultimate proof of who Jesus was. And by the way, before we move on, there is one more thing in verse 6 that I want to point out to you. In verse 6 it says again, when God brings His firstborn into the world, He says, let all God's angels worship Him. When, when Christ came, and this, this verse is, is quoting Jesus, it says, let all the angels worship Him. Angels don't worship people. In fact, when people and angels are, are together, it's people that are on their faces before the angels. Angels only worship God. They bow down only to God. And it says that the angels worshipped Him. So the first and, and really most important reason that Jesus has the authority and that He's superior to everyone and everything else is because of His relationship, because He is one with God. But let me give you some other things that it says here in verse 3 and in some of the other verses. In verse 3, it tells us that Jesus sustains all things by his powerful word. I mean, think about that for a minute. What other religious leader would make a claim like that? Would, would Buddha make a claim? Would Muhammad? Would Gandhi? Would any religious leader make the claim that they sustain all things by the power of their word? Well, Jesus does. In fact, in John's Gospel, John chapter 1, it begins by, by saying, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, entire volumes have been written about this Greek word logos that is translated as Word. And we don't have time to get into to all that, and that's far above what we're fully capable of understanding for most of us. But the point is this, that God communicates His message through Jesus, and it's the Word of Jesus that sustains everything. Verse 3 also tells us that, and, and it's repeated again later at the end of the chapter, uh, that he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Once Jesus completed his mission, once he 
gave his life for us, it says that, that, that he then returned to be in the presence of his father and that he sat down at the right hand of God. That's a powerful statement about Jesus and, and who he was. It's a statement about his authority and about his, again, his oneness with the father. But then in, in verse 8, it tells us that his throne will last forever. His throne will last forever. Now, notice it says that it's written specifically here about the Son. Verse 8, but about the Son, it says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. See, Jesus' kingdom is one that will last. Jed read this a moment ago. By the way, I noticed your arms weren't, almost weren't long enough there, Judd, when you were reading that a moment ago. But it does say, it talks about this. It says, uh, they will all perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. So this idea that, that the throne of Jesus, it just continues to last forever. Jesus created everything. We see that in verse 10. I think we saw it earlier in the chapter as well. He created everything, but nothing will last other than his throne. Now, here's the remarkable thing about all of this. We can talk about all these things um, that, that cause Jesus to be superior, that, that give us reason to say that Christ is exalted and superior to anything and anyone else. The remarkable thing to me is that this God, this Jesus, who is so far superior to anyone and anything else, actually wants a relationship with us. He wants a relationship with you. Jesus gave his life for you. It's remarkable enough that he could do that for us, that he had the authority to do that for us. It's even more remarkable that he would do that for us. That Jesus would lay down his life for us. You know, when I was a kid, uh, I had people in my life that I looked up to that were kind of larger than life. They were bigger, they were stronger, uh, both in my mind and in reality. And as a kid, uh, always being a, a basketball fan, I remember going to basketball games and I had certain basketball players. These guys were giants, right? I just looked up to them. They were, they were massive. Uh, I, I just, I was in awe of who they were. And we used to get tickets uh, occasionally when I was a kid to sit on the floor level uh, of the Mavericks games. And I was at a Mavericks game one time and I happened to be down on the floor. I don't remember if, we, if I was going for concessions or we were coming in or whatever, but the team was coming by. I just remember looking up at these giant players and just thinking, oh my goodness, this is amazing. How remarkable would it have been for me as a 10, 11 year old kid or whatever it was, if one of those players that was so exalted in my mind had stopped and taken a personal interest in me and said, hey, I want to get to know you, I want to be your friend, I want to have a relationship with you. It probably would freak me out, quite honestly. I wouldn't have known what to do. And of course, that doesn't happen. That's, that's not their purpose. That's not what they're there for. But let me tell you something. As amazing as, as those professional athletes were, they weren't nearly as big, they weren't nearly as powerful as Jesus is. And yet this Jesus who is so far exalted wants a relationship with me, wants a relationship with you, that's incredible. And so today as we come to the conclusion of our, our, our message and get ready to wrap up our service, I want to extend an invitation to you to respond in faith by giving your heart to Christ if you've not done that before. Last Sunday we extended that same invitation and several of you responded and let us know that you made that decision to trust in Christ for the first time, in some cases to rededicate your life to the Lord. Uh, I just want to lead you through that same prayer. And so if you don't know for sure that you have come to a point of, of giving your heart and your life to Christ, I just want you to pray a prayer like this. We're even going to put the words on the screen to help you to know what to pray. But let's just bow our heads for a moment of prayer. And if you want to pray, just pray along with these words that you see on the screen now. Jesus, I'm amazed that you care about me. I believe that you gave your life on the cross for me. 
Right now I turn away from my sin and I turn to you in complete trust. I believe you died for me and rose on the third day. And I give my heart to you from this day forward. In your name I pray. Amen. If today for the first time you prayed that prayer to invite Christ into your life, we want to come alongside you. We want to celebrate with you, first of all. You know, the Bible says that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. That means that that if you made that decision, in the presence of God right now, there is rejoicing in heaven. But we want to rejoice with you, too. We want to know about it. The Bible tells us that when we give our lives to Christ, that we become a new creation in Him, that the old is gone and the new has come. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to let us know about that decision that you made to become a new creation by texting the word NEW to the number on your screen. Just text that word to us so we can follow up and and be able to understand a little bit more about the decision that you're making and to be able to celebrate with you what God is doing. See, God's work continues on, guys. He's continuing to do His thing. Um, Even though we're not able to be together, even though we're not able to do some of the normal things, God, I believe, is working through the situation that we're in. He's drawing hearts to Himself. He's doing something fantastic. And it's exciting to be a part of that. And we just want to be able to celebrate with you as you made that decision to trust in Christ as well. Now, before Stephen comes to uh, prepare to share with us a little bit more about how we can pray, uh, I just again want to extend uh, an invitation to you uh, to support the work that God is doing through Gateway. You can uh, you can do it through our online bulletin. There's a, a link already in there. You can go to gatewayonline.org slash give. Uh, but just thank you for the support that allows us to continue doing the, the ministry that God has called us to do and that we're excited to see him do. So, Stephen, come on up and tell us uh, a little bit more about what we can be praying for, anything yeah. we need to know as we wrap up today. Awesome. Thank you, Blake. And you know, just what, what an awesome reminder um, that the, the creator of the, the heavens and the earth has a personal relationship with us and desires us. Uh, to walk in in unity with him and, and that he knows us and calls us by name. And, and just it was a great reminder for me as, as we dive into these closing thoughts and we talk about our prayer points for this week um, it, is that when we lift these things up, that that it's the creator that that has this relationship with us and he desires for us to talk to him and to pray with him. And so, again, if you're a, a guest uh, with us, thank you so much. Um, for joining us this morning. You can text guest to the number on the screen and we would love to, to reach out to you and let you know some of the things that are going on here and, and be able to just touch base with you and see if you need any prayer requests or anything like that. Also, if you do have any prayer requests, you can also text prayer to the number on the screen as well. And just a few of our, our prayer points for the week is please be in prayer for our students and especially our seniors this year as we got the news later in the week um, that, that we're going to continue with the online learning um, for the rest of the school year. Just please be lifting them up and also be lifting up our educators as they're trying to finish the school year out strong and trying to figure out new and creative ways to be able to, to reach these students through online learning. Uh, also be praying for our families to be united and to be united in Christ in this team in this time and be praying for our families to find creative ways to be able to grow together and learn together and pursue Christ together. And the fourth one, most importantly, is continue to pray for the spread of the gospel during this time. Pray that God's word rings true and that we saw it last week of people coming to know who Jesus Christ is for the very first time. And I know there are people out there today that are coming to know who Jesus Christ is for the first time as well. So pray that God's truth and his word and what Jesus Christ has done on the cross is communicated and communicated well throughout not only our community, but throughout this country and throughout the world as well. A few ways that you can continue to support the efforts of things that are going on um, here at Gateway is we are still supporting our local food pantry and we have a basket out front in our north entry as you go grocery shopping this week. You can grab a few more items. Some of the things that they need the most are canned meats and you can drop those off here at the church and we make sure those things get to them. And thank you so much for your efforts already in making sure that our most vulnerable in our community are receiving the food and supplies that they need. Church, thank you so much. I'm so excited you joined us this morning and I'm so excited to be in God's family and God's kingdom with you.
All right, church, we're going to sing one more time. Then he rose. Once more before we go. Why don't you join us? that we are made new in Him. 